Potawatomi, arts, culture, and entertainment. This is a Pace production. Hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. I know it's cold outside, and if you came from Omaha, you know, hopefully the roads aren't slick when we leave. Um, I currently, I am now the program manager for Giles and Kim Bellows Mentoring Program as well. I did prepare like some images. Um, this was the picture, not the previous one that was up on the screen when I was talking, but this is what I, um, from a photo shoot when I was becoming a new fellow, well, for the second time around at the Kent Bell, um, excuse me, at the Union for Contemporary Arts. I'm trying to do this, but this is on a different editing thing. So some of these pieces that I t go into, I like to use female forms, I use profiles. The one I did previously is, um, I like to make molds of faces, like as you can see. And one of the things was is that when I approached this project, my whole goal was to just um, capture the natural beauty and the natural features of people and people in the African American community and those features that link us. So where you can look at that and say, hey, that's my mom's nose, that's my grandma's lips or grandma's cheekbones. And, um, so I was able just to capture some of that and the pieces. So like, but what I found out is that there was another layer that I didn't expect. It was those stories that came along with it. And um, normally when you meet somebody, it takes you a while to get close to them before you know you get in that, their space. But with this, I had to bypass all of that. Um, Celeste would bring people to my studio and Maybe it might be the first time she met them. It's definitely the first time I met them. But here I am talking about this process. Hey, can I put Vaseline on your face? And I give you some straws and you stick them up your nose. Then I make some plaster and put it on your face and you lay there until the plaster sets. That's a hard conversation to have with some people. I was working with um, a football player. And as I was explaining my process, he was slowly backing out of my studio. And then he got to the door and he said, oh, I have to check with my wife. I never heard from him again, but that was understandable because with this process, it is something to where you might, um, when you close your eyes, you can see light coming through, but when you get the plaster on your face, it's complete darkness. So if, you don't, if you're not sure if you're claustrophobic, this is not a good time for you to find out mm -hmm. because um, I've had experiences where people would start fluttering their eyes and the plaster would move. People you know, trying to hold their breath. I had somebody who was smiling and it, and you know, I thought it was funny. And then she said she couldn't help it. She was a kindergarten teacher. And as a kindergarten teacher, you always have to smile at the little kids, otherwise they're afraid. So she would unconsciously just smile. I had somebody who had a, a gap, and he said he loves his gap, so he wanted that inside, inside, of, inside, of, inside of the mold. So what I had to do is, here, take a paper towel, you have to wet it a little, stick it behind your teeth so that the plaster would go through the gap, and Vaseline on the teeth, Vaseline on the lips. And it came out perfectly, you know, so it is, um, the process picks up all your details. If you have a nose piercing, moles, things like that, it picks up everything. So I got a lot out of this project. Um, I did it in 2018, more than what I thought I would get out of it because it's an intimate thing. You're touching, I'm putting Vaseline on your face, I'm touching your lips. Now, how many people can you do, do not know that you're gonna get close enough to touch your lips? Because you know somebody was to come towards you, it'll be like, oh. <laughs> but, but with this, it was welcoming. And then after that, I'm washing your face. So um, it was just um, a very enriching process for me. And it, I learned a lot. I learned a lot from stories, and you find that when you're in that vulnerable situation, laying on the bed covered with, laying on the, you know, the, uh, the mattress covered with plaster, you'll start to share some stories because they're trusting me that I don't let them die on the table. You know, as I had to convince people that I give them a straw and you let them stick up their nose, that's too small. I said, no, it's not. And he said, oh, my nostrils were this big. I said, yeah, but actually the airway 
it's the size of, you know, standard McDonald's straw. So the plaster is not going to go down in your um, face. The, uh, you know, you're not going to inhale it. But um, these are just some of the pieces that I worked on. Some of them are here in the gallery, but some of them, um, some of them have already been sold. Like this was the first lentil cut I ever did. And I remember working on this. And if you don't know what lentil cut, it's linoleum. And you're just cutting into it. And my, my daughter, who's uh, an oil painter, she came to me one day and said, oh, Mommy, you know they have electrical ones now. And I just tell her, I'm old school. I got to do it the hard way. I just can't just plug something in and melt it away. No, I have to dig at it. And um, it took a long time, but I was really happy with, with the outcome because I really like to focus on a lot of details when I um, create things. I, I, I've come to the conclusion I need to make things harder than what they should be. But I'm okay with that. I'm trying to see if I can get this to go again. This bronze piece is over here. And um, this right here is the first bronze piece I ever did. Um, I remember working on this one. And I couldn't figure out how to do it. And um, I actually kept it under my bed. And it was, I was sculpting it and oil-based clay because I could not figure out how to make it look, you know, real realistic and then, but I, you know, you think, of course, if you keep it close by, it's going to come to you during the night. You might wake up and have that aha moment and I did because actually what had happened, I, I thought about it and I imagined taking a piece of nylon, pushing your face against it and turning and then it made sense to me and my professor at that time was, um, Littleton Alston, and he kept telling me to submit pieces to um, this exhibition at the Museum of Science and Industry. I'm like, oh, now, because I, at that point, I didn't think creating artwork was a big deal. I thought anybody can do it. Just sit down and do it. And that was my mindset. So I was like, ah, oh, I'm going to say, oh, I can't do that. Yes, you can. You just haven't tried. Sit down and do it. You can do it. And um, I never forget, he would, I would come to class, and he would ask me, did you send it? Nope. Next class, you just send it? Nope. And I think I had, them tw I had them twice a week, so you know, it was rough. So, um, and I finally said, I better do this before, you know, he's going to get mad at me. So I submitted it, and I, the feeling I had when I got that letter that my piece had been accepted to an exhibition at the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago, and that's when I realized, hey, there must be something to this art thing. You know, maybe I am doing something that is, you know, unique. But at that point, I didn't think it was. I also figured, come on, just sit down and do it. And that was my mindset. And maybe it's because I've been doing it so long. I did this drawing and created this from it. And this was called Deep Down in My Soul. And I had reached out to some, uh, bless you, um, I had reached out to some women I, in the community that I felt, you know, we had a connection and, you know, there were, um, important in my life and um, and I said I just need a piece of fabric what color whatever you know that what it needs like whatever you got and I told him give me whatever you have because I know whatever I'll put it together and everything will flow together and it did I did this is piece was from Celeste right here this was from Patty Talbert boutique she did this purple rice is from, from my mom's fabric this right here it's from Joanna Lafleur Gike. This is from Felicia Webster, and it was two. It was this piece right here and this right here. And um, the thing was is that Felicia's mom had just passed away, and so it was this sequence was part of a heart. So what I did is I took the, the shirt that had the heart on it, and then here's mom's hands, mom's fabric holding the heart. So. Um, please don't get me wrong. I don't, I don't like to do a lot of drawing. Um, I, undergrad, I, had, I came to class with a sketchbook all the time because it, we had to, but mine was blank. I had my name on it. <laughs> I just don't like, I, my mindset is I'm too impatient. The amount of time I spend drawing something, I could be sculpting something, could be creating a piece of artwork. So I don't want to sit there and draw it out because for me, something gets lost in translation. And um, this piece, it was on a piece of vellum. 
I used to be a teacher at Monroe, and down in the basement, they had, when they did renovations, I think in the 70s or 80s down there, or something like that, they had these pallets filled with these giant sheets. So I'm down there with the maintenance guy, I hit the maintenance with Jerry, and I said, oh, this is sweet, you know, he says, he says, oh, you want some? I said, yes. I didn't realize how heavy those things were. Um, I said, I'm, you know, I'm being greedy because it's art supplies, art supplies. You know, artists, you know, when you get it, you got to get it. And I had to drag those things to my car. They were so heavy. And it was like each pack had 25 sheets. And I had like five packs. And I had to, okay, wait a minute. I can take one pack at a time. But this right here is just, I wanted to see what would happen just applying the alcohol-based um, markers on it. And actually, this one sold in the exhibition in Connect, at the Coneco. This is my process when I'm doing the face, and this is what the molds look like afterwards. This is my nephew, Rodney. So when I, when I take the mold off, and you have that, um, it was really challenging with the beards, because I know in man, you, you get your beard, you want to keep it nice and groomed, and um, the first time I did it, um, and I thought, I'd, you know, I didn't realize the importance of using Vaseline. I thought I could, I thought I could use like beeswax because you know it's, it's you know it's going to repel. But it didn't work out, and I ended up having to cut the mask off somebody's face. I wasn't going to break the mask. I just stuck the scissors down there, and the person ended up with bald spots in her beard. Um, and luckily for me, at that time I was married to him, so you know <laughs> he, he had to go leave the house for a little bit to get over that. But now I know that the importance of Vaseline, so. I do that, and so normally what I do after I take the, the mold off, I clean all the plaster out. Some guys um, loved it. You know, they would lean into it, because I'm, I'm scratching, cleaning, and oh, that feels good, you know, don't stop, I think you missed a spot. And you know how you have a, a puppy, you rub the belly, and they want you to keep going and lean into it? So this was what was happening. The guys were like, oh, lean into it as I'm cleaning their faces, because they said it felt so good. This is the book that I did to go along with this series, and this is um, at the opening. This is one of my friends, Barbara, that did his face. This piece right here is the bronze over in this gallery over there. I like to sculpt everything in oil-based clay and um, because I can add a lot of texture to it and it holds the detail for a long time. It doesn't dry out like water-based clay, you know, to, if you ever work and ceramics, you know that stuff. As soon as that water is gone, that's it. But this stuff, it's it used to be petroleum based, but now it's, it's better. So you won't burn your eyes if you touch your face. So this is just me working on it. I'm adding a collar. Um, once again, I'm very detail oriented. So this was like a Maasai collar on here. And then once I got it on, I had to roll everything out and make sure it gets adhered to it. This is at the foundry when it just got poured. This is what it looked like, and this is what it looks like now. So I like to get the dark patinas. Patinas is the color that's added to it. I like, um, a lot of my work, artwork I create focuses on women, um, the figure of women, and it focus on um, people of color and those amplifying those features. I love the richness of the skin tones and how it can be captured with the patina to put on it. This right here speaks to my, <coughs> I don't I want to I won't call it obsessive compulsiveness, but uh, it speaks to my focus on details. This, I wanted to make it look like it was beadwork, but what it, so what I did, toothpick, acrylic paint, touch it. To, take the toothpick, dip in acrylic paint, touch. So this color, it was done using that. And I find it very soothing. This is Patty Talbert, I may have made a, mold of her face as well. So you can see the straws and everything like that and the process of covering up that face. So I'll keep asking, are you okay? Thumbs up, thumbs down. By the time she's too late, I'm just going to go for it. And, uh, and then this is when it, she's completely covered. So this is what happens. It comes off. You cannot open your eyes because nine times out of ten, you will have plaster on your eyelashes. So I have to clean your face and get everything off. This is how the molds were displayed when I was at the Coneco. If you move up close to the molds, you can see all the faces bouncing back at you. That is sort of scary when you're in the studio at night working. 
and then you can look and all of these faces because I, I would have the molds. I did 50 of them, so I'd have the molds in my studio on the floor and you can look and their faces are looking up at you. But it was um, an amazing journey. And like I said, um, this right here, like I don't do a lot of drawing, but I just did just general. I knew where I wanted to go with this piece. This is a kimono my daughter gave to me. She was at a thrift store in Chicago. She said, hey, Mommy, I got this um, fabric. It was kimono, and it's, but it's all torn up. It was hand printed, <clears throat> and it was very old. And um, just said, I figured you could do something with it. I said, oh, okay, let me see. So I, you know, this is what I created with it. And so this was called Daydreaming. This is mahogany veneer on the stool. This piece right here, I was doing a design for the orbit over by, where is it at? 24th and Dodge, one of the, you know, the orbit stations that they had all over town. So I was did this my design the previous design, <clears throat> and then I had to transfer transfer um, it onto the orbit. That was a lot, and I said it was a lot because I had my back to the street, up and down the street, and then on this side it just had a fence. Um, I would sometimes go in early or stay late at night, and you hear the cars coming by. You know, it's sort of scary. You don't want somebody coming run you, uh, run into you. But I was, uh, we used a paint called Sure Krill, which is a marine paint. And if you know, if you ever use it, when you get out in the sun, it gets real thick real quick. But then if the temperature is too low, it won't set up. But um, once I got the stencil down, my outlines down, I just started laying down the paint. And this is um, another example of my dyed alabaster dust. I would do it in any you know, different colors. This is papyrus. This is called Cajun Moon. And um, I, has, I had all this papyrus, and I said, oh, let me see what I can do with that. This is another one of my drawings one day. It's in front of the TV. I just did that, and this is what came out of it. This is, um, that was some fabric from Kenya. This is the piece. I'm going to go back to that one. This piece right here is called Body and Soul. When I had did this piece, um, I was re um, contacted by a gallery in Venice and asked me if I'd be interested in exhibiting um, this piece in their show. And I'm like, oh, yeah, sure would. And um, this is fabric from Ghana. I, I use fabric from Africa, and so I collect a lot of it. This is mahogany veneer. And um, once again, I like to incorporate the shape of a woman. And then you have the two profiles looking at each other. So I like, you know, the sneak in that body. This was a true test. All black around here is the Gorilla Glue tape. And if you never work with that, that's some strong stuff. This is on the bedroom wall upstairs at my house. I did not realize how strong it was until I took it down and it had taken off, revealed all these different colors that the bedroom had been prior because it really, it sticks. I just needed a place, wall space to work. So this is a piece I was asked to participate in the exhibition at the Conneco. So I had like seven weeks to create four pieces. I'd get off of work and I'd come and paint and, and paint. And I just couldn't stop. Once again, I'm going back with my toothpick for the details on it as well. It's spinning, I think it's okay. I was worried that's gonna go off. So that's that piece on the wall back there. And that was called Finding My Way Home. That speaks, for me, that speaks to when, you know, when you have Ancestry.com every place, everybody's jumping into that. It's when you wanna find out where you come from and your ancestry. Well, this speaks to the fact that as um, black people, we don't have that photos being on great great grandmas this we don't have those photos that that history that documents our family's journey because of the impact of slavery that's why the whole background is white there's no story to tell there only thing we do know that we're descendants from Africa that's why this is fabric um, from Africa so um, this 
the series I did was about elephants because I really love elephants. I think they're amazing. This is an etching I'm working on. It is a hundred year old piece of slate from a schoolhouse. Somebody asked me, hey, you want this? Of course I do. You know, and so I break out my Dremels and I do my design and I'm just sitting there. But I keep, once again, I keep all of the dust because I never know. So I have a container filled with that. So this is almost done and then I'm gonna make a big print of it. I have large sheets of paper, I'm gonna make a print. Never done it before. I know the printing press, you know, it might crack it because it's slate, but I want to try. I probably just have to do a, a rub on it. There we go. I'm spinning again. This is a closer view of it. I wanted to make sure I get texture. This piece right here, um, this has that rose gold on it. Um, I just ex experiment. I was look, thinking of looking at hard beats and things like that, and how you can incorporate that artistically. I can't tell you what the this heartbeat of because there's a baby in the room. But anyway, um, but you know, that's just what the heartbeat is. Um, this is a more bronze um, pieces again. Some additional images. This is a piece that's on this back wall over there. When you first come in, um, I, I, I keep this book of graph paper, and I'll sometimes just start working on stuff. Do a couple of lines, I'll leave it, come back to it, refine the lines, come back to it. Then I, what I ended up doing, I added a child here, came back, did, added another child. And then this is when I projected on a large piece of paper. This right here, I had to ask myself, what did I get myself into? Because it was tall, I had to stand on a step stool, and these are all designs from African fabric. Now see, this was the problem right here, because I didn't know when to stop, because all of those little, I wanted to make it look like it was weaving. This piece was made out of sawdust clay. A friend of mine named Edith Weiss, she gave me her recipe for making clay out of sawdust. And you know, so I guess I have, you know, a couple of 55 gallon drums trash cans filled with sawdust that I sifted out and, and I'll make clay out of that. So that's what this one is made out of. I took these faces and I was doing an installation in Kansas City. These are just some of the masks that I did as well. I like to work in a lot of exotic woods. So if you, and when you come in and look to the right, you see Eve's apple, an interpretation of me, those are exotic Woods, the um, sculptor Eve's apple speaks to female genital mutilation that's happening in the United States as well. And um, this piece is, talks about community. I was asked to design an award, and this is my designs for the awards for the um, young, black, and influentials. This is another piece of alabaster. This one I loved, this piece right here, because my mom came, would come over and I'd be working in my studio. And one day she came and I had just started and she said, what are you working on? I said, don't you see it? And she said, what? I said, don't you see this lady's thigh coming out of here and she arching back like this? She's like, no, I don't see none of that. <laughs> it just, she said, it just must be the artist's eye or something. But I did this with hammer and chisel. And I loved it because I could just sit there. And as, as you get to a certain point, you have to be very delicate, not to bruise. Um, the stone, because then you'll see those white marks in it. I call this natural beauty because it speaks to, I used to work at a place called Utah Holly and this little girl was telling me how she turned 16, she's getting a nose job. And I said, whose nose is it? And she was like, what do you mean? I said, whose nose do you have? And I said, do you have your grandma's nose? Or whose nose? She said, I don't know. I said, why would you want to get rid of it? Because that connects you to grandma. I said, you know, it's just that natural it's your natural beauty. I said, don't. I said, because one day you're going to want it back. You know, what are you going to do when your child has that grandma's nose? You know, I said, no. I said, just, you're naturally beautiful. Just embrace that. Don't try to erase it. I'm just applying some beeswax and orange oil to the piece. Um, that's an interpretation of me. I love the way the colors come out. So whenever I get an opportunity to get reintroduced to some new wood, I, I grasp it. I don't believe in staining stuff. 
that I think getting ready for this exhibition, so a lot of the work I already had done, but I was in the process of creating one piece and it was hard for me. This is um, a photo of my, from my, my mother, I think she was like in her 20s. My mother smoked cigarettes for 10 years. Started when she was 30, stopped when she was 40. That was it. But she smoked Bel Air cigarettes. And um, when she passed away, I realized she had kept every last coupon. Now I remember back in the day, you, see, you know, you can send your kids to the store, go me a pack of cigarettes, give them the money, you go and come back with the cigarettes. It was just how it was, you know. It's not like you didn't need a note or anything like that. You just go get them, you know, the good old days. So um, I wanted to take the cigarettes, the cigarette coupons, and create a piece of artwork. I knew I wanted to do something. And um, so I had this photo of her when she was just sitting down in the lawn. My mother was a fashion place. She loved to pose, loved to be dressed sharp. Everything had to flow, shoes, purse. She had her pearls on. So I decided I was going to use the coupons. And so that was, once again, that was one of those things where I said, what did I get myself into? Because I had to cut those coupons. And of course, these are from the 70s. So you know, these babies were stiff. Some of them were stiff, you know, and the, everything had transitioned. They went through, through the ones that had the long strip to the ones that were like little squares. I couldn't use the little squares, I'd use the long strips. So I had to lay everything down, make sure everything's facing the right way, make sure you can read everything. And I started adding them on. It, was, it stayed on my dining room table for a long time. So I had to add everything on, and then once I get everything on, then I had to clip and curl to create the ruffles of her dress. And I, I was really mad at myself because that just like took forever but I knew I had to get it done, I had to do it justice. But um, man, those coupons. And I still got a lot of them too. So that one's right over there on the wall. I, I, it's titled Mary Lou, because that's my mother's, my, my mother's name. And see, here's bundles of these coupons. This was a piece um, that I had to connect with. This is my other orbit. This is on 84th and Dodge. And um, this, Prior to this exhibition, I was in an exhibition on 18th and Vinton, and it was about color. So I had to create this giant piece. This is half of a seven-foot circle that I had to cut. This is what it looks like finished. And this, um, once again, this is designs from African fabric. I think we're coming to the end. That's Frederick Douglass, a little bronze piece. You saw that when you came in. I used to weld. I used to plasma cut, make take, all that other stuff. I hadn't done it in so long, but I created this piece called Lip Music and um, for a show in Kansas City. This is me experimenting with some stuff. You don't want to know what I did with that stuff. Um, you know, <laughs> because I'll find, you know, I'll experiment. This piece was a bronze piece that's over on 24th and Grant right now. It's an outdoor piece. so. I had to d design, was asked to design a monument for that area, and this is how it's coming together. And that, I did that in my dining room, sculpting that in my dining room. So I had, I still have oil-based clay stuck in the, in the floor, because that's hardwood floor, so it's all like, when, some, when I come across, I'll try to dig it out sometimes. So this is what it looked like when it got installed. I keep, I, think, I feel like it's getting ready to shut down, because I keep buffering. So I'm trying to move faster. So it won't shut out on me. I like this because this is a knee high. You know, you have the knee highs. That was just a knee high that I took, some wire, a little piece of two by four, pulled it down, glued it, and then I manipulated. And this is the outcome. And it sets up hard, so that was perfect for me. This piece is right over there. This has Bart Vargas. If you know Bart, this is one of his dreadlocks. I had been hounding him. Man, it's an uh, art piece waiting to happen. So one day we had an exhibition, and he took it <coughs> and gave it to me. I'm like, OK, perfect. So this is bone and incorporated. And this is terracotta. This is bone, and I incorporated copper wire in there. This is from a sweet dumpster dive I did. Um, and I found this bottom of the barrel. Anything so? Yeah, I'll do that. This is um, a piece 
called Hear My Prayers. <clears throat> this is a piece I just sold at the Venus Art Auction. This was, um, and part of me didn't want to sell it, part of me didn't want to put it in there, but it's about, um, at the time I was pregnant um, with my son right here. And, uh, yeah, he's <laughs> like, um, so um, I was pregnant with him, and then I was, you know, last, on my last trimester, and I got the news that my father had passed away. And then I um, went into labor, and they delivered my son. And I remember being in the hospital crying. And it was not just crying because my father had passed away, but crying because I knew what the world had in store for my black son. So, and um, that's why I have, you know, hear my prayers, and that's why you see the profile looking up, just praying, you know, as all mothers do for their children and their children's safety. So that one I really feel it. This natural beauty again. This is Eve's apple when I'm working on it. And this is Eve's apple project I started. This is my drawing. By the time I finished watching the documentary, I had the drawing and I created this piece. So I think we're coming to the end. This is how the masks were displayed at Koneko. And that should be, I'm hurry it up. That should be it. I think that's the last slide there. Oops, you wasn't supposed to say that, sorry. Don't look, you wasn't supposed to say that <laughs> Look, I'm covering right here, like, <laughs> like, like you, I'm blocking it, but I need to be covering it there. Okay, so uh, that's it.